Thanks a lot, organizer, for inviting me here. Uh, you will see I'm a computer scientist, not an astronomer, so I'm extremely, but, but I'm passionate about astronomy, so I'm particularly happy to be here with, uh, with you today. So since I'm not from your community, maybe I will start with a very short presentation of myself, something that I, I'm not very happy to do usually, but so you get an idea who is talking to you. So I'm a computer science professor. I happen to be Italian. I live in France. I'm married to an Argentinian, and I do computer science. So I have four languages made. In my head, my English not necessarily as good as it should do, but I hope you will survive. So I have spent over 30 years doing what, what every professor does, so doing research and educating the next generation of engineers and researchers in computer science. I spent over a quarter of a century working in everything related to open source, free software. I was an advocate for free software developer, et cetera. And then as you see, when you grow older, you think that some gray beard or something like this, you think the time has come to assume responsibility and create and direct organization at the service of common good. So the last, uh, the, the subject I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, software heritage, which is my last undertaking, but which is in the framework of uh, open science and also member of the National Committee for Open Science in France. And I co-chair a task force for infrastructure and software in the EOS at the same time. So as you su may suspect, my main issue today will be software, okay, not data necessarily. So what has software to do with open science? Well, we have been saying for a long time that software is used all over in science in all disciplines. But I remember when I wrote a paper about this many years ago, one of the reviewers said, mm -hmm. do you have evidence of that? Well, evidence was very complicated to find, but luckily a few, uh, a few months ago, the Ministry of Research in France published a new version of the Open Science Monitor, which is something that has been this developed by the Ministry of Research for tracking the adoption of open science. So at the beginning, it was just for publication. This year, there is a beta version that tries to track use, development, and sharing of data and software. And this is just one of the pictures of what you can see in uh, this data, collected from 160,000 research articles from uh, French research in all disciplines, that you find that basically, on average, 20% of articles across all disciplines are actually mentioning the sharing of software they develop. There are much more that are actually just using software. And this is really across all disciplines. And actually you in astrophysics are pretty top of the line, huh? not the first one, but the third one there. So there should be no question today about the fact that when you are talking about open science, there are several pillars. We have heard a lot of, of many of the others uh, this morning. But at least when you have a research article, you read the research article, you, you see that uh, this research group has actually analyzed a bunch of data doing some transformation analysis, and the end result is 42. If you want to check whether the result is true or not, the paper by itself is not enough. Of course, you need the data. And a lot of people focused on the data in the past because they thought, well, once I have the data in the article, bingo, I'm done. And then if you start looking at how complex the analysis are, how difficult the pipelines, et cetera, et cetera, so maybe you try to re-implement what the article says, and at the end you get 54. Did you get 54 because 42 was not correct? Did you get 54 because the data is not the right one? Because you didn't implement the right process? Because there is something that you are missing in the details? The only way of knowing actually getting access to the experimental tool used by the people, which are actually the software tools. So we really need open access for the article, open data for the data, and open source software for the software. And of course, here the links are very important. Okay? I need to be able in the paper to find the right version of the data, the right version of the software, etc. Well, and if you think about software, software is a very special thing in, uh, in uh, research. Because it has at least three different, the same software may have three different facets. It can be a tool for me. I take a research software developed by, by some colleagues somewhere else. For me, it is just a tool. I'm using it to do some data analysis. But for the team who developed that research software, it is much more. It is the output of their research. Okay, it is a result of the research. And then the very same project can be studied by somebody else, for example, in software engineering, to understand whether it was developed properly, what are the good recipes for success, etc. So it becomes an object of study. 
Okay? A tool, a research outcome in the object of study. And if you really want to take advantage of all this, then you need to have access to the source code of the software. You cannot just use a black box that comes from nowhere. And actually, access to a source code is not even enough. You really need to have the history of development of source code. If I dump on you one million lines of code, good luck understanding what is going on, right? even with a good documentation. Sometimes you really need to go through the virtual control system and see why this line has been added, by whom, fixing what bug, adding what feature. So the history is important. It, it actually, it is important for reproducibility because at some moment you have a result that uses the particular version of the code. When you come back uh, two months later, it, the, the new version is not the same. You want to check what changed. So the version is very important. And so this is why I insist a lot on the fact that when you speak about software, it is really important to have access to the source code because it is in the source code that you find the knowledge. And you know, when I was a student, and if you look at the date there, uh, uh, it was quite uh, some time ago, uh, I, I was using a book by Harold Davidson, which is an incredible professor of computer science at MIT. He was the one who launched this idea of Scratch for teaching programming. He was at the beginning of the first foundation, beginning of the Creative Commons, etc. In the introduction of his book, he said the programs must be written for people to read and only accessorily for machines to execute. I mean, looks like a joke, okay? It's an MIT professor telling the students, if you turn in a homework I cannot read, you will get a bad grade, sure. But actually it is much deeper than that. Because as Donald Knut used to say, Donald Knut is one of the founding fathers of computer science. Uh, he wrote this incredible book, so called The Art of Computer Programming. He was used to say that programming is the art of explaining to another human being what we want the computer to do, okay? So it's not just that. Uh, back then in the 80s, it was kind of complicated to understand the real meaning of these assertions because there was not much source code available. Because the, the economic model at the moment was that all the company were closing down the source code and only sending you a license for a binary. But luckily, we have today access to an incredible amount of beautiful pieces of source code. For example, this one, and this is selected just for you since you're in a, in astronomy, this is a short excerpt of the 60,000 lines of assembly code that was embarked on the lunar landing module that allowed us to put the man on the moon in uh, July 1969. And if we put the man on the moon back then, it was because a, a woman, Margaret Hamilton, was leading a big group of programmers who actually developed all this code. And, and maybe speaking about gender issue, you know why there was a woman in charge of a, such an important project in, uh, back in the 60s? Well, because in the budget of the Apollo program, there was not a single line for software. Nobody thought about having software. So it's always happened when they discover they did some software, they look at who, who is able to do it. Uh, it so happened that Margaret Havito was running some simulation in MIT and so she got in charge. So look on the left here. On the left, for, for those of you that, that are not scared, you get a little bit of assembly code, the way we used to, to do programming back then. And that assembly code is a little bit complicated to understand. You need a, a manual, et cetera, et cetera. But on the right, after the number sign, you see real comments in natural language, in English, that you can still read today and tell you what actually is going on in that particular moment. So let me take a couple of minutes because this is a moment of pleasure for me. So I, I just explained to you what is going on. And so I, I was six years old when, when there was this moon landing. And I remember we were all in the family in front of this TV screen, black and white with these people landing there. You may remember, and there is a beautiful movie that came out for the nurse a couple of years ago eh, with a new roles. Uh, you see Armstrong uh, speaking super calmly in, in the mic when going to the moon, and you, you have this tiny triangular window, and you see the, the, the surface of the moon coming on. Well, if you keep doing that, you will just crash. At some moment, you need to turn the module around and fire the rocket for, for landing. So this is a piece of code that is executed when you need to turn the module around. So you see the beginning, the first line, and forget about the assembly code, you just read the comments. The first line is, okay, is the LR antenna in position yet? LR is a landing radar antenna. So if the landing radar is in position, you are getting 
signal, you know it is already, the module is already positioned as it is. If it is in the right position, you go, you jump to the end of the procedure, which is basically off to see the wizard, and then the wizard is another procedure that the file, the rocket, forget about the details. And then if it is not in that position, you ask the astronaut to do the operation of turning the module around. You see, astronaut, please crank the silly thing around. Okay. And then this shows a number on the on the display, it was called the disk uh, console there, that tells the astronaut to do the thing. And the astronaut has two choices. One about the mission, the other is okay, I did it. So if the astronaut says about the mission, you terminate. Otherwise, if they say yes, yes, the module has been turned around. You see, proceed, see if he's lying. You know, there is this old mantra that sometimes when you have a bug, it is usually between the keyword and the seat. And uh, so see, he's lying, you just jump back and check if the antenna is really in the right position. And you keep bugging the astronaut until this is done. So you see, this was written over see, 50 years ago, okay? You can still understand what is going on. And what is after the number sign never goes to the machine. This is a message for you, okay, for us, for the other people seeing what is going on. And you will tell me, well, well, but this is was just because it was assembly code and nobody understand what assembly code that. Not really. Fast forward some 30 years, this is an excerpt of a mythical routine that you find in the Quake 3 Arena game, a quick free arena for, for the younger people is the ancestor of Call of Duty. I mean, this kind of thing that um, <clears throat> our kids spend too, too much time on. I mean, you, you shoot everything that moves. And when you do a graphical computation, you need to compute one over square root of x very, very often. And when this game went out, the numerical processors were not very efficient. So this routine is actually a super beautiful piece of code that implements uh, one of a square root of its own floating numbers using only manipulation of bits as integer numbers. So I will not go through the details because it will take an afternoon, okay? But you, you, you can look this up and it's fantastic. And you see, even here, the name of the variables, the comments, etc., and even lines commanded out that, uh, that will never go to the machine are essential to understand what is going on. So to sum it up, as Len Schuster, who was a former director of the Computer History Museum in, in Silicon Valley, in a beautiful article he wrote in 2006, he was saying that actually having access to the source code of the program provides us with a view into the mind of the designer. You see, it's very poetical, but actually it's very true. It's the only way to understand what is really going on. So source code is precious. And the reason I'm insisting a lot on this is that I have seen a tendency over the past decades, in particular in, in academia, to conflate software, and in particular source code, with data. Of course, everything is data. You know what data means? Data is a plural of datum in Latin. It is the entry value for a process. So your DNA is data. A poem is data for GPT, ChatGPT, etc. And everything is data. Okay, of course you can represent it, but doesn't mean that the poem and the piece of DNA are the same, right? And so here, software source code is not data. Let's remind about this why. I mean, software evolves over time a lot. I mean, so there are some project last decades. The Linux kernel running on my machine was starting in 1991. You have thousands of people getting in there. The development history is key to understand what is going on. And software is complex, maybe complex because it is a big piece of code, or maybe complex because it depends on ton of hours components. For example, the little picture that you see on the side is the list of dependencies that are pulled in your machine as soon as you run the Python interpreter and you just type import matplotlib, you see? So it's complicated. And there are many other human aspects. So the design, the algorithm, the funding, the management, etc. It's, it's very complicated, not just data. It's not just the picture from the sky or the list of econometric values on some place, okay? It's a different object. It's, it's like literature. And so we need to treat it properly. Are we actually treating it properly? How are we handling our software today? Well, if you look in academia, 
the situation is far from ideal. Okay, we have a lot of issues with reproducibility, traceability, maintainability, sustainability. So here is just a collection of a bunch of papers that show you what is going on. And I added the link. Everything which is in light blue are links. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an old academic. So there is this tendency that I cannot say something without pointing to supporting evidence. So the slides are, are in the chart and you can click on the links you will see what it is. So on one side in academia, we're very focused on this reproducibility issue, which is essential. But if you look in the industry side or in the public administration side, there are a lot of red lights open already about security, integrity, traceability in, in industry that bugs that create problems across all the software supply chain. And they're interested in knowing who actually wrote the piece of software that got included in a piece of software that you're acquiring or buying or integrating or selling or making service about. And uh, actually, I will not have time to delve into this, but this kind of issue that we have in academia, the kind of issue that you can see in industry are very similar. So traceability or reproducibility, et cetera. They, they carry different names, but are more or less the same thing. And the result is that finally today, you have awareness which is raising at the level of public policy. And here are a bunch of examples which are not exhaustive, okay? How is, what about this emerging policy framework? Now, back in 2018, uh, 14, 40 international experts were summoned at UNESCO for two days working on creating a declaration the Paris Code on Software Source Code. There are many, many, many points in there. You will see it's UNESCO style. So I hope the people will not kill me. I mean, it's been considering this and uh, uh, remembering that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We call on people to do this and that, that, that. But in particular here, they were calling to, in the academic world, to promote software development as a valuable research activity and research software as a key enabler for open science. And you remember what has been uh, said this morning by, by Lourdes or by Eva, I mean, incentives. I mean, we need to recognize this in the career of academics. I mean, not any contribution, contribution of quality software, that means software which is important for your community, not necessarily which is designed by the best software engineer in practice, since you are not software engineers necessarily. And then in this recommendation from UNESCO, you get the point that open source is clearly mentioned in UNESCO as one of the dimensions of open science and actually the fact that infrastructure should be uh, open and non-profit. Then in the EOSC, you have uh, a, a, finally, one of the documents from the EOSC 2020 is an analysis of the scholarly ecosystem and how we should interconnect the different components to actually allow to have software which is properly archived, referenced, and described, and cited. And uh, there are so much more. For example, in, in the European Open Science Conference in February 2022, that place in Paris, uh, there was a full software track. Uh, there is a working group on software in science Europe. There is a, a new model for curriculum vitae for getting funding from the DFK, which is a German uh, funding uh, commission that says that on top of papers, you can present in your curriculum also data set and software explicitly. And you remember in December, NASA unveiled their open science policy that contains a full chapter on, on software and so on. So things are starting to move. Then if I can put for a few minutes my, on my uh, careless head, the, the hat of, of a member of this National Commission for Open Science, in France, we have been working on this for a few years. So in 2021, the National Strategy for Open Science that was published there, these are official slides from the Ministry of Research, by the way, and the QR code, you have one which is in French, one which is in English. Uh, there is incredibly a full chapter dedicated to software, so opening up and promoting source code produced by research with a bunch of action to be done. Okay, so I will not go into all the details of what this means. There are 25 people from one discipline working together since then to actually advance the recognition of software development, help developers doing a better work, helping researchers doing a better work. So I will not go through this. Uh, unfortunately, it's funny, but I don't have the time. So if you really want to take into account research software in academia, what are the needs actually? And do we have a strategy to address these needs? 
So there are many things at stake. For example, take a piece of software you have developed. It's already been done, it's fine, etc. Now you publish a paper. You want to make sure that the software used in that particular paper is available somewhere, will be available for people to actually find it and reuse it. So you need an archive, a place where you put it and you are sure it will stay there. And this is important for reproducibility. You also need to reference the exact version of the code that you're interested in. Because if you are, I can only tell you, go to GitHub on this particular project, and which branch, what version, what commit, why it works today, it didn't work yesterday. I mean, it's not enough. I need to point to the right version. Then I need to describe the software, getting enough information into the software to make it easy for other people to find it and reuse it. Well, in, you know, software has been born a lot of time ago and open source were there a lot of time ago. So there are a bunch of good practices that are very used in the open source community. You need to have a readme file, an install file, a dependency file, etc. It has been there for ages, didn't wait for us huh, doing open science. But maybe we can do it in a more modern way. And finally, we have this issue of giving credit to the authors. So citation and credit to the author, which is important because as soon as you talk about credit, you are talking about evaluation. And we heard this morning how this difficult and political this is. So these are key issues, but they are not the only one, of course. Before that, the point is, how do I develop the software and make it maintainable, et cetera? So what are the good development practices? I mean, using version control system, quality tools, et cetera, et cetera. How do I build the community around it? Does it make sense to build the community or not? Depends on the software, et cetera. So this needs training, tooling, et cetera. But also beyond this, we have policies. Do you have a policy that tells people that if you're using public money, then the software you produce should be open source or not? You have policy for recognition in careers, etc. What about sustainability? You cannot sustain a piece of software by just paying for a project. Maintenance is not development. It's not the same thing. And actually, the, the funding instrument we have usually do not take software maintenance into account, these kind of things. And so I do not have time to go through all this. So I will just focus on the first part, OK? Archive, reference, describe site and credit. Now, archive, oh, come on, this should be easy, right? We have been archiving things for ages. Well, let's look at some popular approaches that we were using in the past and that do not necessarily fit the bill, okay? When in the 70s, uh, we used something called FTP. Anybody re reminds you, yeah, file transfer protocol, servers, et cetera, they have been discontinued. Uh, supporting the browser has been discontinued some 10 years ago. Then we had the web. Ah, fantastic. Now so people started putting their source code in a tar filing on a web page, typically their home web page. Uh, then a uh, web page maybe is a little bit fragile, so people start using document archive. So putting the zip file or tar file in a document archive, getting a DOI, and you're happy everything works. And then the, in the 2000s, we had a little bit of a revolution. So you have this code hosting platform, Forges, Source of Forge was the first one, 1999, huh? together with a subversion, etc. And so we started using software forge, which are much more practical than downloading a zip file and trying to see what is in there. You can see the code, you can make comments, you can open tickets, you can collaborate with the people, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have project on institutional forges, or on, on, on free commercial forges. Today, GitHub is all the rage, but in 1999, it was source forge. And then you have a GitLab in, in instances of GitLab, et cetera, et cetera. And you can click on the blue thing, you can get example of this. And then finally, in academia, people started to say, hey, we should actually make software visible as an academic result. And, and since actually in, in, in publishing DOIs are, are, are the alpha and omega of everything, they tried to, to do, people tried, and, and again, I'm not criticizing anybody here. I'm just showing the reality and I'm doing it in my own discipline. So um, the, there is no, no danger. So for example, the Association of Computing Machinery, which is ACM, which is very popular in, in computer science, they have a digital library and they try to, to have software artifact there. So I, I, I have hidden all the identifying parts, so I'm not blaming anybody particularly, okay? But you see, you have this badge, the artifact is available, it is evaluated in functions, they have badging in uh, ACM for, for ages, and then you have the author, and then the only thing you get is this DOI, 
And then some, a short description, and you see that the author in the short description is not happy of having a DOI. He, he tried to smuggle in the URL of the, the GitHub project. So it is in the, in the description, so you get, get it there. I don't care about the zip file, which is behind the DOI, etc. cetera. So I mean, it's kind of a mess. So we cannot get no satisfaction by, by quoting a popular song here. And, and so A is a poor experience. So getting a zip file or a tar file, I have doing that a lot many decades ago. Come on, we can do better. B is much better than Forge, okay? Mm. But there is a hidden problem. There is no guarantee of preservation there. And C is the kind of a mix of the two, which is not satisfactory for anyone. We can do better. Well, why forges are not archives? Code hosting platform are not archives. Today you say, I mean, put your project on GitHub, it's fine. But the point of, there are many reasons. The first one is that you can put your project on GitHub and then in a week you remove it. So if you have a link, it, it just disappears. But it, there is worse. 2015, Google code, 700,000 projects. And Gitorios, 120,000 projects just shut down, okay? So basically one million in dungeon repository and software of mine and I had papers pointing to uh, repositories in Gitorios, published in 2012, we will see it. Now points to nowhere, I right? said so not, not really nice. They say, okay, but that happened just once and that will never happen again. Mm. 2019, Bitbucket, another popular uh, code hosting platform said, hey, Git is very popular. This other version control system we were supporting, which is called Mercurial, where there are only 300,000 projects using it. And so that, that's nothing. So uh, we are very sorry that we are going to remove it. And actually they did it. So in July, 2020, 300,000 projects went away, including projects from colleagues of yours. I will show you an example later on. And then this last summer, summer 2022, I do not know if you follow this kind of news. I mean, some internal documents from gitlab.com were leaked to the public, uh, where uh, the people were thinking of automatically removing all the projects that were not active for at least one year. So, you know, when you do academic work, it may happen that you have a project which is not active for any effect. At least mine, for example, I go there every now and then, and you go back and it disappears. I mean, that, that's not really nice, okay? And even us in my institution, which is National Institution for Computer Science, you would say, we had an old forge, an old technology, we move it to a new technology, which is GitLab. We send messages to everybody saying, hey, watch out, we are moving, move your project from here to there, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the day finally the platform has been unplugged, all the build system of the Ocamian programming language crashed because uh, it was downloading the source code from a particular place in the old fork. Okay. So repeat after me. If you want an archive, you should look for an archive. Okay, don't, don't get the copy. Okay, so you, need, you really need an archive. So now we need a universal archive of sources of code, and this is lead finally into the subject of the talk, okay? Now we have one. The good news is that now we finally have one. So now let's meet it. It's, it's called Software Heritage. This is an initiative was started in 2014, so we are almost nine years in the, in the making. The idea is from the very beginning, the objective of this initiative is to build a universal archive whose mission is clearly spelled in three words collect all the source code publicly available outside, preserve all the source code publicly available outside, and share, make available all the source code available outside. It's written in the front line, okay? So it's a part of the mission. It is not a side effect. And if you want to, to see what it can provide in a, in, a, in a nutshell, I mean, first it is a kind of a reference catalog that provides you the list of all the projects that exist on the planet. Now, software is developing in a collaborative way on tons of different places. GitHub is the most popular, but is by no means all the projects that are developing. You have tons of projects developing and distributed in other areas. Now you finally have a place where you can find them all. The second is building an archive. So here there is a guarantee that what you put in the archive will stay in the archive. Guarantee that you do not have in code hosting platform because it is not their mission. 
And last but not least, and here a, a, a little hint to, to your own work, I mean, and you see I'm passionate about your work. I mean, uh, I'm so admirative of your community. So in astrophysics, you manage to pull together across all the countries and find the time, the energy, the political support, the funding, etc., necessary to build beautiful instruments that allows us to explore the galaxy. How comes that in computer science, in computer technology, where there is no lack of money in private company, by the way, we have been unable up to now to build a very large telescope to explore the galaxy of software development up to now? I do not have the answer, but what we are trying to do with the software heritage is to build the first brick of this common infrastructure. And we go over this a little bit. So how would you go about building a universal software archive? Well, because there is a political side, you do not do it hidden in a garage, huh? okay? You need support to avoid all the disaster we have seen in, in open access over 25 years, but I will not, I do not have the time to, to go into the details. So we made an agreement with UNESCO and uh, we uh, got support from a bunch of different learning society and organization, the Open Source Initiative, Free Software Foundation, a lot of like, like things. But this is not enough because this is, lateral support is fine, but at the end of the day, you need to pay engineers and to buy machines. So you also need to have a, a network of sponsors and members, etc. So here, my big thanks go to INRIA, which is this national uh, institution for digital science in France that accepted to launch a project when they it was just an idea, okay? They supported us from the beginning and they keep hosting the, the organization for the moment. But then you have many, many other people coming in and they are not coming in for a project. The problem of a project when you build an archive is that an archive must last. If you only have project money, the project money comes today and three years goes out. What do you do? So we need another model, and this is basically membership fee, and you see the different kind of participants here, including government organization. The Minister of Research in France is a member of Software today. So this is a political side. But what about the technology? When you think about building a universal archive, the idea is that you want to really build one single infrastructure serving the needs of a plurality of users. So we are building a single infrastructure, collect, preserve, and share source code, all the source code, code with its own version control history to address the needs of cultural heritage. You want to rebuild the history of development of software in many disciplines, areas, etc. Of industry, the needs and knowledge base and traceability for vulnerability or service. For open science, the needs of clear, unique, well-defined repository for research software. For public administration, they need a place we are making available to the citizen for long term, the software which is used to take decision about us. And we definitely want accountability and transparency there. And it is today the largest software archive ever built. So these numbers are not up well anymore. We will see the real one later, but it's over 220 million project archive today over 14 billion unique source code files archived in there without its version. If you're curious to know where this comes from, of course, GitHub is there, but many, many, many other places. And even GitLab is not just gitlab.com. It is all the instance, GitLab instances on your institution. <laughs> so how do you do this? Well, we be technologically, we basically built a very large, uh, gigantic, a uh, harvester that connects to all the possible places where source code is developed and, and, and distributed. So in, in to connect there, unfortunately, this is more complicated than doing a web archive because in the web, you have a, a, a uniform protocol HTTP and you have a, the only thing you need to care are URS. Unfortunately, all these platforms have different protocols and different APIs. So we need to be the adapters, which we call listers, so we have an adapter, a lister for GitHub, a lister for GitLab, a lister for, Git, uh, Git, uh, for Bitbucket, a lister for Debian, a lister for PyPy, a lister for NPM, and so on, so on, so on. And this lister go to this platform and get the list of all the source code that are in there. But then you discover that, uh, you know, we in computer science have difficulty on putting ourselves, uh, on agreeing between ourselves. So everybody comes up with a new format. 
the package forms are all different. A version control system, there are so many. So you find there are some projects maintaining using it, other using Mercuria, other are still in subversion. There are some on CVS also. There is DARS, so there is Bazaar. And then for the package format, come on, tons. So we decided to go the extra mile and actually we create another layer of adapters, which are called loaders for us, that actually pull in all these source code with all their version history and decode the version history and re-encode it in a universal, unique, uniform data structure, which is a gigantic graph, technically a Merkel graph, you know, the same technology used for, for Bitback, for, sorry, for Bitcoin, yeah. for this wicked by system, etc. And this graph contains the full global development history of software around the planet since the very beginning in a uniform data model. It is a more than 14 billion unique source code files from more than 20, 220 million. I do not have time to update the slides every time, can't go on. But it's basically one petabyte of compressed data. This impresses my friends in computer science. I come here, I just learned it for you. One petabyte is a picture. Okay, so fantastic. So you have space. If you want to make a mirror, I know I, I need to come to talk to you. But anyway, but this is 30 billion nodes and 400 billion edges. It is probably the biggest social graph publicly available today. The graph of the web is bigger, the graph of, of probably of the other social network may be bigger, but it is not public. It is closed and uh, uh, by some company. So this changes radically the way we can do archiving and reference or research software. So let me spend a little bit of time here. Why this is again changing having software edges in infrastructure? First, because you have a universal archive for all the software out there, not just the software that you decided to archive in a particular place, not just the software that was developed by your group or by people that you know. No, all the software, including all the dependencies of your project and the dependencies of the dependencies of your project and so on, they will all be archived. And also, it is in a uniform data structure. It doesn't matter if the project, the original project was on GitHub, on Bitbucket, on SourceForge, on PyPy, on NPM, on whatever, on Debian, or Ubuntu, etc. Everything is converted in a uniform data structure with a uniform mechanism for a version control system and a unique, uniform, intrinsic identifier that do not depend on development platform. Okay, many people use Git hashes sometimes in their paper, but the Git hashes depend on Git and depend probably on the GitHub platform or the platform where it was. The identifier we provide are not the same. So I will, since I need to make, how, how much time do I have? Uh... Okay, okay. Well, okay, so let me take a few moments to clarify about a few trivial concepts that sometimes we tend to conflate, okay? Because now, when I'm telling you in the revolutionary part, which we archive all the software code, source code, this is kind of clear. But when I tell you we are using a uniform intrinsic identifier, I, I'm not sure we are all on the same page. So let me take a few minutes to explain what I mean. So let's go back again to what we mean by referencing a piece of source code. And to make it more clear, I will make a very simple example, which is worth a thousand words. You know, when you think about this kind of object and identification and location, there are actually two different concepts. One is identification, the other is a location. For example, take a book. You flip the book, on the back there is a number, this ISBN number, International Standard for Book Number. So every copy of the book has the same number. It is the same book. I mean, the, the particular edition of the Don Quixote de la Mancha from Cervantes has a particular ISBN there. This is even standardized. There is an ISO specification for how you write this ISBN. But then you have a separate issue that is to say, well, imagine you want to get a copy of this particular book. And this is a location issue. So you want to go to the library and you want to call out a copy of the Don Quixote de la Mancha. And then, then you get another thing uh, because, I mean, the same 
I mean, copies of the same book, there may be many, there can be many locations and the location can change. Maybe somebody changes the order of the books in the same location, you don't find the same thing again. So this is a location. And there are many approaches for having call numbers, okay? But when we are talking about reference, a particular version of source code, we are interested in identification of the precise version of source code. We are interested in, not on where it is, Identification and location are two different things. And so when you are looking about identification, and we are talking about identification, there are basically two different ways of building identifiers for objects. One is extrinsic identifier, the other is intrinsic identifiers. And the main difference between them is the relation between the object and the identifier, where you do keep this relation and how you maintain it. And this persistence is the key property we want. You all heard about persistent identifier all the time. But let's think about persistent, what it means, okay? The, the, the binding between the identifier and the object must be maintained. But now if you look at extrinsic, extrinsic here, a very simple table to understand what things are doing. So in extrinsic identifier, the relation between the object and the identifier is maintaining something which is called the register. And it's a place where you say this identifier corresponds to that object. Very simple example, your passport no number, your social security number, the ISBN book okay, number, the, the, um, all these kind of things. If you do not have the register, just looking at the identifier tells you nothing. There is no link between the identifier and the object. And in, in the pre-internet era, you had this kind of thing. In the internet era, you also have this extrinsic identifier. DOI, a restricted identifier. Handle, a restrinsic identifier. Art, a restrinsic identifier. And uh, the point is that there is no guarantee of persistence there. Persistence is real external. If you, if you don't, don't trust me, you go to the RFC 3650. I mean, that's the definition of the handle system. It says persistence is a function of administrative care. So sorry about this, but I mean, if you just get the DOI, that's not the end of the story. You need to make sure that people will maintain the link if you move things around over time. Otherwise, you are lost. And this has nothing to do with the technology, just administration. Intrinsic identifier, on the other hand, are very different. An intrinsic identifier is intrinsically bound to the object itself. So persistent is trivial, is internal. The only thing you need to agree is on a convention. In the pre-internet era, we had a couple of very popular examples. The musical notation. If I tell you do on the fifth scale, or, or in England, I mean A on the fifth scale, you do not need a register. We all agree on a convention, you know what it means. If I tell you NaCl, sodium chlorure, okay, we all know what it is. We agree on a format for building the identifier for the object. Well, in the internet era, we have the same thing. We only use cryptographic signatures for object. You compute the identifier from the object. Okay. And typically in Git hashes or these kind of things, Bitcoin uh, numbers or, or the identifier we provide in software that are the same. And actually, distributed software development, the thing that you like so much today, I mean, using Git, this kind of thing, was born using this technology. Before that technology, we didn't know how to do. But the point is that now we need a uniform intrinsic identifier, one that does not depend on a particular code hosting platform, a particular version control system. So what we did in software heritage is to design this identifier, which are called the software heritage identifiers. They have a prefix, as WH, let's say this is a software heritage identifier, and then a version number, because the schema can evolve over time, then a tag that tells you what are we actually identifying, and this can be a file content, a directory, a revision, a release, a snapshot, a repository. And then, of course, you have the hash computed out of this. For computing the hash of an object is very easy. For a file, you just run SHA-1 sum on the file, and that's done. For computing a hash of a complex object, of a tree or a graph, that's a little bit more complicated. This is what is known as a Merkel construction. I will not go through this. Then we add a bunch of qualifiers that allows you to tell people, yes, I want this particular file content here, but as it was seen in a particular version, a particular project, so it's more interesting to get the context. So these kind of identifiers are now part of the Linux Foundation Software Package Data Exchange standards, starting from version 2.2, the prefix register with IANA. Uh, there is a Wikidata property that corresponds to this kind of identifier. 
And you see, the thing that you can do when you have this kind of identifier, you can embed, you can embed this identifier in a presentation. And then you click on this. And you see, now I'm in the software heritage archive, just in front of the fragment of code that you have seen in the simple example that I gave you at the beginning of the presentation, you see. Now I'm in front of the code inside the software heritage archive with a uniform identifier. And since it is an archive, you will stay there. Okay, if you just point to the GitHub uh, thing, as some people did in 2016, maybe it will get broken later on. Okay. So the breaking news here that we started the standardization process for this identifier. And by the way, we have changed the name. They are no longer called software heritage identifier. They're called software hash identifiers because they are not related to, to the archive in any way. If you go to this link, swhid.org, you will see the standardization process. There is also the slides and the video of the presentation of how these identifiers go. So I will not do this today, okay? You can find it online in that particular moment to understand. The reason I spend so much time on doing this, I, I'm sorry, for some of you, this will seem very trivial, but some other people, it is not trivial to understand that an archive and a code hosting platform are not the same and that in, you need intrinsic identifiers for software and not just extrinsic identifiers. So I hope it will be a little bit more clear after this presentation. But okay, so finally we get to the point that I like the most. I mean, let, let's do some demo time. Okay, let's see some things. So how do you browse the archive, for example? To browse the archive, you go to, uh, again, archive.softwareagent.org. This is the way it is presented. So you go down, you see all the actual numbers. So you see we are actually on 233 million projects and, and over 15 billion unique files. So it changed a bit since when I prepared my slides a couple of months ago, okay? And uh, here you have the breakdown from the most important origins that we decided to highlight. And when I told you, I mean, this is actually all the different var variants. So GitLab, you have uh, the big fish, gitlab.com, almost 4 million project, but you have uh, uh, the uh, GitLab of my own institution, GitLab of other places. And it, we will see it is extremely trivial now for you, any of you, if you have your local code hosting platform to request archival or the full platform. And I think number one, I, I have already shown you how I can get a particular piece of code by using this identifier. We'll go back a little bit. And it may be, it may be that without doing anything, your software is already archived, okay? Which is a big win. And actually this is what happened to a colleague of yours for, for as much as I can say no. So you know, when Bitbucket actually disabled all the Mercurial uh, repository, despite the fact that they put a blog post telling people, hey, we are gonna disable this. If you have some stuff here, please make a copy somewhere else. But he just didn't know. And then he came back later when the people from the astrophysics source code or library told him, look, uh, the software associated to your paper has gone. He was very dismayed, but then he discovered actually we were working in a software agent with a small company called the Octobus, who was expert in Mercury to actually archive everything. And actually, his code is safe. And okay? he's still in uh, in uh, in the place. And you can uh, uh, wait. Remove this. And uh, when you look here in the inner, you see there are discontinued hosting. You see, this discontinued hosting are the full copy of the full archive of Gitorius and Google Code when they were shut down in 2015, and of the over 300,000 projects removed from Bitbucket when they removed support for Mercury. So you actually can find all this right now. So short message will be more clear in a, in a moment. If you put in a paper of yours a pointer to the version archived in software heritage, then you are safe. Because even if the code hosting platform goes away, even if you move your project around, the version you wanted to mention there is there. And then you can tell me, ah, it's the same as the other. 
And not really. Here you have the full version with the full version control system. You can do Git clone on it if you want. It's not a Z5, right? and you can browse it completely. So because it is designed for software. So Zenodo is a beautiful platform. The only thing, it was not a software, it's not a platform for software. It was the best in town until software was available, but now it's, here it comes. Now, the kind of thing, question you may have is, okay, okay, so you have found a piece of software and I, I can reference it. By the way, how can I reference it? Let me show you. Okay. I'm going here. This is a library of mine. Uh, this is the archived version. So you see the presentation. You are just you, you get the impression you are looking at, code, at the code hosting platform. Okay. So the, the readmes are rendered. You can navigate inside the code. You are going to the source code. For example, this this for the curious one, this is a Pretty nifty implementation of a map reduce on a multi-core machine by leveraging some tricks in, in, in the in the Linux system. So it only works on Linux or Unix. And now I can look at the source code and see, look at all the information that you have. Here it is telling you this has been fetched from uh, GitHub. The last snapshot, the last copy has been taken on May 1st, uh, uh, 4th. Here you have all the visits. If you click here, you have all the times you went there. Very important because imagine that somebody changes the history of the, the version control history at some time. You go back to a previous visit and you find the old history and not just you know, a new one. So all the comments that exist at some moment in time will stay there. Then you have a lot of information, for example, the text that it is OCaml, so in, in the particular programming language, you have a, the, the file which is pretty printed, etc. And then I can say, mm, look, an interesting part of my algorithm is here, between this line and this line here. Okay. And then you pull out to this permalinks box here. And you see now you get the identifier. Look, there are two versions. The identifier of the file content, but in that case, it is just the file content. If you look for this file content, you will find the file content, but you do not know, not know how it is called, where it is, nothing else. But if you add the context and information, it tells you, okay, this is a file uh, that you're interested in, the hash of the file content, but we are interested in lines from 67 to 80 to 80 of this file as it was called source per map.ml inside that particular revision, which was part of a particular status of the repository uh, from this particular origin, which is a GitHub uh, origin repository. So this means that if I copy the permalink and I put it in a paper or in a documentation or in a tweet or in a, in a chat somewhere discussing somebody else, when you click on this link, and now I'm simulating by just copy pasting, you will end up on the same file in the same fragment in the same exact context. Okay, you can branches, etc. You see, it's, it's a frozen image of what you had on GitHub or GitHub or whatever, etc. And, and this works even if you are using tar files or zip file. It doesn't need to be on a version control system. If it is a package on PyPy, it will work the same way. I am saying the same, identify the same structure, same visualization. And then you tell me, ah, this is beautiful. I want to use it. But what happens if my code is not in? Or uh, your crawler is slow and has not already gotten the version that I wanted. I thought. Then you can trigger archival. How do you trigger archival? You go here, so archive.software.org slash save. You can go here on this save code now. You select the origin type. So it can be a bazaar CVS Git Mercurial or subversion repository. You put the URL, like for example, here I'm putting a particular URL, one of the project. Click submit. No password, no registration, no nothing. And you are just triggering this. It is now in the save request queue. You see, here it is. Accepted, not yet scheduled. In a couple of minutes, it will be archived. And you see, since we announced this functionality uh, one year and a half ago, we had almost 300,000 requests for archiving. But then you say, well, I need to put something here and there. Don't you have a better way of doing things? Well, yes, you can go. Uh, let me go here. 
you can go uh software item there is a browser extension that you can install on uh, on uh, firefox on chrome on uh, microsoft edge if somebody has a mac is a developer for mac please give me a hand and we can also port it to safari if you want i just happen not to have a mac you know, for the moment actually this is installed on my machine so let's have a look at a couple of things so for example you see gpt okay? so this is a repository on uh, on uh, github that has awesome chat gpt prompts you see this little icon here that pops up is a browser extension it is yellow in a sense yes it is archived but not up to date it tells you the last change here uh, and it is cut in the video but is on, on, on today i mean i changed something just today and the last archival was on the 28th of, of uh, april now you go here you just click once it becomes light green that is to say not yet archived it is it is triggered click now a second time it brings you to the, the, the save request queue. So, so you see, first of all, you can see that the, the previous thing I asked to archive has already been archived. It's here, and, and somebody came in in the middle. And here is our request already in the queue. That's it. In a second, zero time, just clicking a thing. And, and you can trigger archival on, not just on your project, on the project for everybody. If you just want a particular version up to date of a particular project, you do it. I have shown you this on GitHub. You can do it exactly the same way on GitLab, any instance of GitLab, on Git, on Bitbucket, etc. works exactly the same way. But then you say, mm, clicking on a button, come on. I mean, my project, I want it to be archived every time I do whatever an update. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm guarantee I'm not paying this guy, but you see this particular project there? This strange icon here it says that this save request was created from a webhook. Indeed, if you look at the API, here and here, how do I get to the API? Here, web API, then the endpoint index here, and then the request archive at entry points. You will see that now we have added webhooks for Bitbucket, Git, GitHub, GitLab, and SourceForge. So for any of these platforms, if you have a project there on that technology, then you just copy the right thing. So this archive software.org slash API slash one test origin test save, they would put then GitHub. Okay. And you copy it in your project. So let me see if I have one open. Let, let me do it on. Well, for example, on the specification of the, the identifiers. Okay. We go to settings here. Webhooks. Come on. Webhooks. Add the webhook. Yeah, password. Confirming I'm the right person. And then here you put as a pay payload uh, all, 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 all the URL that I have shown to you. And then you choose which event should trigger the automatic save. For example, typically what I do, I put branch of that creation. And please don't do it on every push. Okay, not every time you make a commit, it's a little bit too much. But typically when you have a release, well, I, I have no means of preventing you from putting every push. And if you want to do it, I'm just asking kindly not to do it. And um, you can choose a release. Then you have the webhook. Forget about it. Every time you create a tag and there is a release, automatically saving a couple of means with all version history up to that point. Okay. So this is actually really getting very, very safe. And then Okay, and then, and then there are many, many, many other examples, but I wanted to show you just one thing. Let me see if I can. Let me give you an example of what it means in terms of publication. Okay? 
and don't kill me because there is a beer here. I had no choice in 2012 to have this published in that thing with the colleague. So this is a description of the Parmap library you have seen on GitHub today. Uh, back then, 2012, I really wanted to play the, 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 the right game. So there is an example of the example, etc., etc. And at the end, I was telling people, look uh, where it is. Uh, yes, so the full source code of the Parmap library is available under the LGPL license on gitorios.org slash Parmap. The only problem is that if I go to Gitorios today, <clears throat> dead, because, uh, yes, I'm finishing, it's dead. And, uh, but, but I try to have a face safe mode. So I was saying, okay, Gitorios, but otherwise, I was also saying it is also, wait, it is also available uh, here. It is also available in the Godi installation system for a kernel library. So as a package manager we were using 2012. Now, 2015, Gitorio shuts down. So the first link is that. 2015, we developed a new package manager for Camel, which is called Open, and God, it disappeared. So if you just get this paper today and you want to find what the hell is going on, no links whatsoever. Yeah. Now, imagine that you look at a new version of the paper, actually create this new version of the paper here. I will try to keep my time properly. Okay. Now the change in this version of the paper, it is the same source code, but of the paper, same LaTeX paper, but I recompiled it in 2020. You know, see? It, 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 I recompiled the change in the little things. The little, first little thing is that in the figure with the algorithm, at the end of the figure of the algorithm here, which is the key algorithm of the, the system, it, now it is written, this is a simple implementation, et cetera, et cetera, Simply, slightly simplified from the original source code because you know when you are publishing a paper you don't have a lot of space so typically you remove the error correcting lines or the comments etc to make it fit and now you click there and what happens haha <laughs> now this is a real source code associated to this algorithm for a reader or reviewer that's much better right and also at the end of the paper what i wrote Instead of just saying guitar, you see, I didn't change much. I said just uh, here. Uh, inclusion. Where did I add the pointer? I don't remember. Well, I don't remember where I put it, but I add the pointer to the archived version. So now, even if the card goes away, you go to the archived version, it's fine. So uh, I will refrain from doing more things. Now, I, I go to the conclusion. A few adoption indicators. So, and, and, and now, starting from now, this was my, my agreement with the session chair. You can stop him any time by asking any question that you want. Okay. But you can ask me, but this is a new game in town. Never heard about that. I mean, how why should we use that thing which is new? I mean, so what are some adoption indicators? Well, since we do not sell identifier, unfortunately. If I could charge just one dime for every one of the 15 billion identifiers there, I would have solved the financial issue of the infrastructure. So I, we do not charge for anything. You do, we do not need to you to create an account to save everything. I have no clear indicator of usage. So we have only external indicators. For example, for, uh, for a presentation at the Open, Zooms, uh, Open Science European Conference 2022, Melissa Harrison, who was uh, head of publication at eLife, Ask a, a data scientist in their in their division to do an analysis of the paper with a simple analysis of the, the reference. And, and so here were the papers mentioning software. So 2,000 links to not available things, 1,000 links to GitHub, 380 links to software heritage, and 142 links to the node, et cetera, et cetera. So adoption is coming. Here, people in computer graphics are now uh, have a replicability stunt initiative. So they check that the paper is actually contains software, can be downloaded, run, executed, etc. They have a DOI to the paper, the pointer to the repository, and the pointer to the archived version to software heritage. 
The funding agency, so the, the national funding agency in France is now asking all researchers get the public money to archive their software in software heritage, make it available on hard. And they do not have time to do more demos, unfortunately. Now, this is part of the national open science strategy in France. And who is behind this? You have a team, we are more, more or less 15 people. I have ex been extremely lucky to assemble a team where you find somebody like uh, Jean-Francois Bramati, who was the first CEO of the W3C consortium. He worked with the team Bernard and he has been an advisor for the years. Stefano Zakiroli, who was Debian project leader for three years and many other people, extremely motivated for doing this. We are getting civil servant salaries, okay? Not Google money. So you need the motivation to stay there. Then many ambassadors, one is in the room, moment, you can add more information about this there. Then contributors to the platforms. You have some awards that were gotten there. There is an annual report that you can find clicking on the link. We have a couple of videos showing you the evolution of the code base and the, the evolution of the projects and actions, concrete action, and then I really stop. So I think now we have, I, I couldn't see the part which is described in site. I mean, next time you invite me, I will show the second part. But I mean, now the best practice for archive reference described in site are there, and we have the infrastructure, finally, which is a uniform infrastructure, open source, non-profit, in collaboration with UNESCO, international, for everybody. So you do not need to be French at all. Actually, it's better if you're not French to use on the platform, etc. And so any piece of code, even a small fragment of code, make sure it is archived and references so everybody can reuse it and find it. If it is more than just a snippet, you want to have a description, citation, etc., you can go an extra mile, but I don't have the time to show you. Now the big question is training people, engaging journalists, and you know, academia is, is my life and I know it is slow, so it will take time, but it depends on you on making adoption of these practices. And now, unfortunately, the policy maker went away, but I just share it will be recorded, right? So a second for the messages to a policy maker. So for a working agenda here, first of all, avoid proprietarization of things that use public money. So publicly funded research software should be open source, unless there is a reasonable exception. I mean, privacy, defense, security, whatever. Now that should be the default. Then avoid balkanization. So as I was telling you, I have spent 25 years in open source and I have seen what happened in open access and we made a mess. Okay, now we have more than 10,000 repositories, open access repository papers. And depending if you have three quarters, you have three copies, one here, one there, one there, three different identifiers, a mess. Let's build on a common shared infrastructure, like for software, we are lucky, Blue Sky strategy, we have software right And then, you, I, I have seen some, some people nodding before. Remember that for common infrastructure, which are based on software, the key issue is maintenance. So it's not enough to fund the initial part. You need to foresee in the economic model how to support maintenance over time. And this means money. And finally, for evaluation, and I'm really stuck here, there is a law in economy, which is called Good Heart Law. Okay, that basically says that when a measure becomes a target, a political target, it stops being a measure. So if you start saying that you will evaluate the contribution of people to software by counting the number of commits they make to a project, and don't laugh, this has been a concrete proposal that I've seen now. Let me know, I will be committer number one, I will write a little script, I will be committer number one immediately, okay? so. We need to keep the human in the loop. Let's not do a numerology number two. So sorry, I'm a little bit longer than for a scene. And then I'm stopping here. The floor is yours and I'm ready for your questions. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you so much, Roberto. This was super informative and definitely opened up something for me. I had no idea, so no right. Okay, so. thanks a lot. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but there are no questions. So I want to see who here has a question and Julian will run around with the microphone. I know it is after lunch, but make a little effort. Otherwise I think the presentation was boring. And <laughs> There's a question there. Thank you very much. I loved it. It was a nice talk. 
a very quick question. Do you have a guarantee that the um, um, the the the, um, the database that you built is there to stay forever? <laughs> this is in other good. words, what happens if for some reason I don't wish it the system goes down? The keys are they still available, or is there a a plan to make it um, yeah sustainable? Thanks a lot. This is a brilliant uh, up to the point question. So when you start an initiative like this one, you really need to, to think about the long time. And you, date in, you need to identify the challenges. There are many challenges. Some are technical, okay? Your, your data center go, can go up on fire or you get an earthquake and things go out, etc. Some are financial. You can get, run out of money because people don't support it anymore, etc. Some are legal. At some moment, doing what you are doing may become illegal. And you know, we had to face all of these three challenges. So in our, and, and if I may use a joke, you know, a, a, an Italian comedian that unfortunately became a politician uh, used to say, I had a joke, which was very nice. And he was coming to the stage and say, hmm, you remember the Titanic? Why, why, did it, why did they call it Titanic? If they had called it, let's see if it floats, maybe it will still be there, right? And you need to be humble. So we decided to be humble. We know we will make mistakes. We know there'll be difficulties. So we need to plan around all these challenges. So plan number one, the identifiers you have seen are computed from the object themselves. So imagine something that goes away. Imagine in 10 years, there is some important paper in biology that say, hey, we found the cure for this particular disease. The model of the molecule is available there. If they put a URL, you are probably dead. If you put a DOI, you have better chances. If you put a sort of edge identifier, sort of harsh identifier, if this is really important, you can send a message to everybody on the planet and say, we lost this very piece, important piece of software. Can you just hash everything you have on your old your machine just in case we can find in a copy? If you find if there is a copy, you will find it. So this number one. Number two, but you don't want to have all this data go away. So what you do, you create a network of mirrors. Okay. So we are establishing a network of mirrors, and a mirror is a copy of all the archival software run by another institution that has just an agreement with us but in another country with different uh, organization, et cetera, et cetera. And the most important one is actually the one which is run by ENEA. Okay, ENEA is the national agency for alternative energies in Italy. There will be, the EMIRO is almost ready. So we are setting it up in Bologna near the Leonardo supercomputer that you probably heard of. And that's just the beginning. We, we need more. There is another which is planned inside the EOS as a mirror, et cetera. And then what about, the, the challenges funding. This is why we are not just building an infrastructure for open science, because maybe there is interest now and will fade away in 10 years, not just for industry, not just for public administration, not just for public for cultural heritage, but for all of them. And we try to have all these people on board. So we minimize the risk, you see? And everything we build is open source, not the single line of proprietary software in all the software stack or software agents. So somebody else can retake it and run it. More than this, I have a little bit difficulty of, of doing right now. So we can all be there tomorrow, but we tried to have some safeguards and, it, and now it depends on you. You need to adopt it, use it. If you know somebody want to run a mirror, please do it. If you want to contribute, you please do it. Everything is open and, and you will be all very welcome because this is not my project, it's not my team project, it's not an area project, it's not a French project. It is a worldwide project designed this way since the very beginning. Sorry, very long answer, but it was a very, very important question. Well, it is time for coffee break, so we could have a short question. I don't see anything on, on Zoom and Slack is empty too, but don't forget you can ask, is there one more? Yeah, one well, more. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, thanks, Roberto. So, I was wondering, probably many people have already think, thought uh, about this. Um, I, I'm guessing that the idea is not replacing uh, platforms like GitHub, uh, GitLab, uh, and so on. But uh, many might be tempted to, for example, just only use software heritage without yeah. using GitHub. For example, can you? Yeah. 
uh, upload upload the code directly if it is not in GitHub or uh, you already said that uh, can, you can be asked not to send every push to to the <laughs> to the platform but I'm guessing for example that is only a matter of having enough resources to yes to 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 make it possible so what opinion do you have on this so many many things here um we did since the very beginning we decided not to enter into the game of replacing a code hosting platform because then you are fighting against giants like GitHub, GitLab that are funded in billions and hundreds of millions. It's not an easy thing. And also, because there is space for innovation, we, we do not want to prevent innovation there. Maybe something else will come out. You have seen Git is getting very popular today. So we tried to be humble and only create the infrastructure to having archival reference preservation, etc. So, but then if you do not use a version control system, you do not use a code hosting platform, you just want to submit a zip or a tar file, you can do that. You will be able to do it through the Zenodo soon, I hope, as soon, I mean, soon, I mean, when we finish the collaboration with them to, to, to get the connection working. You can do it through the National Access Portal in France. You can do it if you know an ambassador, they have the key to deposit a zip file. We, it is not open to everybody because I mean, if you deposit with V5, then we become mega flow, which is not exactly what I want. But so the, the, uh, the idea is again to, to, to stay on this side, archive and uh, reference. What we will provide you, and I do not have time to show you, will be incredible technology that you will be able to use in the archive to trace the origin of software, finding similar objects, et cetera, et cetera. It will take time to develop that properly. But again, we do not plan to replace code hosting platform code. So please continue to do the collaboration wherever it is more comfortable for you. The only thing, make sure you make an archived copy and that when you use a reference, use a reference also to software edge. You have seen in the reference to software edge, there is also the link to the original repository. So you can get back if you want. So maybe uh, if you just can clarify. So do you, because I, uh, do you still kind of crawl this platform? So if for example, uh, scientists don't, do not, uh, don't uh, go and archive the copy, is it going to be archived at some point in, in any case? Yes, yes. And th that's the point. That's the other extra point. So we are doing crawling systematically. So you saw that this case for, for the guy that lost the code on, on ASL. Uh, he didn't do anything. We were just there. The only point is in very in full transparency. You know how many projects there are on, on, on GitHub today? You have an idea? 300 millions. And there are millions of projects added every month. So up to now, we, are, we had difficulty closing the gap. There are tens of millions of projects that we still not, did not archive. Again, it's just a matter of money and resources, okay? We, we do not have the resources, number of callers to go after them fast enough. So for software that you care about, it's better to have these webhooks, et cetera, because it will go on the top of the queue. But eventually, we will close the gap, even if you don't do anything. 